we can get started. And this is a, a, a public hearing, the, the, and I'm going to start with a public hearing on the proposed 2023 county budget. Um, I'm sorry, just the where an agenda. Okay. And first of all, I would like to begin, and I would like to ask uh, Representative Aaron to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you, Representative Aaron. And happy Flag Day. Yes, that's right, happy Flag Day. Okay, so now I would like to go around the room, and I'm going to, I'm again, uh, Representative John Cloutier, Chair of the County Delegation. I'm going to introduce the other members of the delegation, and then basically my intent is to turn it over to the commissioners, because it's, it's their budget, and they will do the actual hearing. So I'm going to begin uh, starting on my left with Representative Smith, please. Thank you, Representative Stephen Smith from Charlestown, representing Ackworth, Charlestown, Goshen, Langdon, Webster, and Washington. Good evening. I'm Representative Aaron from Sullivan County, District 7, and I represent uh, five towns of Ackworth, Goshen, Langdon, Lempster, and Washington. And good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm Representative Tanner. I represent uh, Sullivan, District 9. I represent the towns of Cornish, Plainfield, Croydon, Grantham, Springfield, Newport, Sunapee, Unity. I think that's it. <laughs> okay. All right. So rep go ahead, Representative O'Hearn. Representative O'Hearn, Sullivan 3, Ward 1, Claremont. Representative Sue Gottling, uh, Sunapee and Croydon. Representative Terry Spilsbury, representing Charlestown, District 8. Representative Skip Rollins, uh, District 6, Newport Unity. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes. And okay. Represent. I, I see on Zoom, and we do have a quorum, so he can participate. Representative Stapleton, please. And can, can you hear us, Representative Stapleton? He's smiling. Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Could you please identify yourself, Representative Stapleton? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. I guess that's all we're get. Okay. All right. So, all right. Thank you, Representative. All right, Representative Stapleton. Or is there anybody? I think that's it for all the people who are, who are attending so far. So again, I am Representative John Cloutier from Sullivan District 10, which comprises the entire city of Claremont. And again, I am the chair of the Sullivan County delegation this term. So I'm now going to turn it over to the chair of the Sullivan County Board of Commissioners, George Hebert, and he will, uh, together with the county manager, Derek Furlan, present the commissioner's proposed fiscal year 2022 county budget. So go ahead, please, Commissioner Hebert. Thank you. Um, as you all know, this the uh, delicacy of doing a budget this year was a little more challenging than the past uh, for several reasons, but it, it, the balance between trying to take it easy on the taxpayer and take care of your employees and your infrastructure uh, can be pretty challenging sometimes. Um, we, we tried to present a budget that fairly does both. Um, we don't feel we did enough this year to take care of our infrastructure and our employees. We feel we probably could have done more. Um, but we have to look at the taxpayer too. Um, and it, it's not going to get any easier probably in the future um, because the county is not a for-profit organization and we can't just raise our prices when things get bad. So. Um, we, if, if we could ask the delegation um, to really, when you look at the budget and pay attention to it, if you would like to do more, we would welcome that. Um, and uh, we just ask you not to uh, really try to chop it too much and take too much away. Uh, we've, we've tried.
tried to keep this as, as fair and as equal as we could. So we really appreciate your, your the EFC for all their help. Uh, they were very, very easy to deal with, uh, and, and they're always there to try to make things happen the right way for the county. So I appreciate all your, all your support and all your help. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Heber. Yeah, okay, go ahead, please, Man our county manager, Derek Furlan. All right, thanks, uh, Chair Coutier. Um, so, uh, Derek Furlan, county manager, before I get into the PowerPoint presentation, I wanted to take a couple minutes and at least introduce the uh, county staff members uh, that are here in attendance. I'll start with our elected officials. So we have the county sheriff, John Simons. Uh, department heads from the nursing home, Ted Purdy, I should say our soon-to-be former. Nursing home administrator, but we still got him for a couple weeks, so thanks for coming, Ted. Uh, Lionel Chute, our Director of uh, Natural Resources and also the head of the uh, Sullivan County Conservation District. Uh, we have, uh, from the Department of Corrections, um, Superintendent Dave Barry, much like Ted, soon to be former, Superintendent Dave Barry, as well as his newly hired replacement, Superintendent Mark Deem. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Mark recently joined us from uh, Grafton County, where we were able to... Uh, poach him away and uh, really excited about what he's going to bring to the team. Uh, we also have uh, from the DOC, Lieutenant Sean Coughlin. And then uh, next to him is Louis Thibodeau, who is our business office manager in the nursing home. And in the back, in the commissioner's office, we have uh, Sharon Callum with the headset on, or used to have the headset on, as well as uh, Doty uh, Violet. And last but not least, from UNH Cooperative Extension, uh, Penelope Whitman. And on the uh, big screen here, uh, Mary Burke is joining us from home. And of course, you can see Commissioner Nelson as well. So without further ado, I'll share the screen for the... Okay, um, similar format to what you all have seen in the past, so I'll, 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 be, I'll expedite where I can, but if anybody does have any questions at any point, please, um, please let me know. Here is um, an overview of what we're going to cover today. Starting with uh, the county functions, again, just as a quick primer for anybody who might not know, we have two campuses, one in Newport, one in Unity. Uh, most of the elected official functions um, are in Newport, including the county attorney, the sheriff, and the register of deeds. Uh, we also have the commissioner's office and UNH Cooperative Extension. And in Unity, we have all of our uh, appointed departments, nursing home, jail, facilities and operations, human resources, and uh, natural resources. Uh, the top's cut off, unfortunately, in one of the downfalls of Zoom, but we just quickly review our strategic priorities. This is important because in a perfect world, we should be aligning those priorities with the budget decisions and the financial uh, decisions that we make every year. Uh, the first one is investing in our people. Uh, that's making sure that we're attentive to the training needs, thinking about things that en enhance retention, um, recognition, wellness, and, and looking at individual development plans to just make sure that as we recruit new talent, we recognize and grow that talent to help meet our mission needs going forward. The second goal is to be really smart with the resources that we are blessed to receive from our taxpayers through the delegation, uh, not take those for granted, and be uh, developing sustainable budgets, developing asset management plans that are uh, responsible and make sure that we do care for the infrastructure that Commissioner Hebert mentioned at the, at the opening. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're connecting citizens with land. We have 2,200 acres of public land, and it's important that the public not only knows about it, but that we put ourselves in positions for the public to be connected to those uh, acres of land, whether it's through trails and hunting and other recreational activities. And of course, being innovative to make sure that we can stretch those dollars further and further and be smarter with the way we do our business. The last goal, uh, exercising responsible regional leadership. And of course, these priorities have been very uh, prevalent in recent years and uh, helping support the municipalities when it's requested and where it's appropriate. Uh, we want to make sure that the county never develops a reputation as uh, overstepping its bounds with respect to uh, the municipal entities in our county. 
Um, we also like to partner because partnerships are the best way to, uh, to get things done, especially in a resource constrained environment. So we work very closely with UNH Cooperative Extension, um, the Upper Valley Lake Sunapee Regional Planning Commission and others to help enhance our mission. Um, another of these big regional enterprises has been our Sh Sugar River Region uh, initiative, uh, largely led with, uh, with Penelope's efforts and uh, of course many others. Um, but we've also gotten into the adult education working with our tech centers, the one here in Newport that we're here tonight, as well as its companion tech center in Claremont. And uh, a more recent uh, foray into this regional leadership category is the HUD lead paint abatement program, which has been uh, very successful so far and we're excited with the progress uh, that we've been able to make on that. Again, that's another example of how we help support all of our municipalities in the county, but it was really led by efforts from the city of Claremont with uh, raising the awareness on uh, lead poisoning and where the county was able to come in and apply for that grant uh, made more sense because the city of Claremont acting on its own would have been ineligible uh, to apply for those funds. So just one way that we can work together. So a quick year in review, uh, just some of the topics we dealt with is transitioning really from COVID, the emergency response to more of a daily battle rhythm of managing it, um, trying to get back to normal, uh, even if there's air quotes around the word normal, uh, trying to make sure that we can get families into the nursing home to visit, uh, trying to make sure that our staff is continually prepared with the necessary PPE and that the communication changes as necessary in, res in response to uh, whenever there's a few outbreaks, it's incumbent on Ted and his team to work with the state. And some floors have to have enhanced PPE and they go beyond masks, but to full face shields and eye goggles, but not everywhere in the building. So as we figured out all those different routines, it wasn't easy. I mean, it was, it was a pain and it continues to be a pain to work in the nursing home, uh, but our staff continues to do great things uh, to meet the needs of the residents. Uh, the needs of their fellow colleagues and also the needs of our families to ensure that everybody can still be as close to normal as, as what we thought that meant three years ago uh, prior to COVID, but still do things safely and smartly. And then as we looked ahead to the end of last year and coming into the beginning of fiscal year 22, we knew we had some economic impacts to address. And so we used ARPA money in one particular instance to address some pay gaps to make sure that we were compensating our eligible staff, primarily in the nursing home and the jail, um, appropriately with the thought that we would study wages over the winter, come up with a wage proposal, and just kind of fix things with this budget. But we, we never could have anticipated the magnitude of what those economic impacts uh, meant for us. And when we started to really study the local wage landscape, we were frankly stunned that it just seemed like everybody jumped to at least $15 an hour. I don't think that's anything we could have anticipated uh, back in July or August of last year. So that just made everything more uh, difficult. Um, but we did make major progress on some big projects. And so that was good. We had Sullivan House, which we cut the ribbon on, but we unfortunately still haven't been able to move anybody in for other reasons I can get into later. Um, we had the nursing home working group, which was a lot of work on behalf of the five member team, four reps and a commissioner and a lot of participation from county staff and some consultants to really dig deep into all the details of the nursing home project and make sure that we have the right plan in place. And of course the Sugar River region went from an abstract concept to something that's really gaining some legs and a lot of positive momentum and energy and it's very exciting. So that was all pretty cool to do in addition to everything else that we were juggling. And I alluded to some of the significant personnel changes. It's never easy to have um, major changes in your leadership team. And we're juggling not just Ted and Dave with two department heads, but we also have uh, DON, which stands for Director of Nursing. So the good news is we're making progress. Obviously, Mark, Superintendent Deem is on board. We're very close to having a replacement to Ted. Uh, nothing we can share publicly at this time, but we're probably a week away from making that announcement. And then um, the search for the next director of nursing is ongoing. The good news is we have a really deep bench within our nursing supervisory and leadership team. And so we, we have an interim plan that we're already implementing. And so it's, it's much what we did before when we had a, a DON vacancy. So we're not assuming a lot of risk in that department, but it's still a lot of work to find the right person. And really the bottom line here is it all comes back to our people. Our people are our greatest asset, our greatest strength. Um, they once again de demonstrated in spades their toughness, their resilience, 
their dedication and passion for this job and the, and the citizens of this county uh, and their flexibility to continue to adapt a changing environment, uh, not just on a weekly or a daily basis, but sometimes within the same day, things are just changing. And so, um, yeah, it's tough. There's no, there's no two ways about it and there's no way to sugarcoat that, but I think it speaks to the strength of, uh, of our team to continue to, to go with the flow. Um, so here's just a couple of uh, photos to, to describe kind of what the year, the life with COVID. Um, and you can see it really didn't do much to uh, stop the spirit of our team from doing things to, in, to boost morale of themselves, their colleagues, as well as the residents. It seems like every week they're dressing up as something new with a new theme, some crazy idea. But I think it's, it's wonderful. It's just awesome to see the, uh, the enthusiasm for that. So you see a lot of the staff members that are masked up. If you see somebody without a mask, they're probably a resident. Um, also point out, I think there's, oh, this is a, I don't know if this thing points or not. Well, I don't want to risk it. I'll probably shut something off. In the upper right corner, you see a gentleman in a, a military uniform. We had some National Guard uh, personnel come in to help us in our kitchen. Uh, we've had some severe staffing shortages over this year. And so the National Guard was able to spend a few weeks uh, with us to help out, and that was great. And then down in the lower right corner, you see our spirit animals that um, are a real boost to the residents on the floor, but also the staff. It's been pretty fun. So we've got, I don't know, a couple of cats, a couple of rabbits. I don't, they seem to be multiplying, and not just because they're breeding, but just <laughs> they seem to be growing. But it's, it's a pretty cool thing, um, and they're always posting about it on Facebook. It's, it's, it's good fun. Uh, I mentioned the uh, nursing home renovation, so just a couple of the headlines from over this past year, talking about the work of the working group, um, and you know it was a big challenge, and we, we spent a lot of time going through in depth, reviewing the scope of the project, talking about the, the cost, any ways to try to cut it down, uh, the phasing strategy. We engaged the services of a third party consultant to come in and kind of look things over and both validate the approach and then give us a sense of what they thought the cost would be if we started construction later in this year. A lot of energy uh, in participation on behalf of the delegation, the commissioners, the county staff. So it was really, uh, really good to see. It was a good process. It was a lot of work. I mean, we spent the better part of this uh, fiscal year really digging pretty deep into this. I think one of the other positive side effects was that, is it helped spark um, a bill that Representative Aaron sponsored um, in the House session last year to create a statewide nursing home capital reserve fund which unfortunately was quickly shot down by the Ways and Means Committee. However, comma, uh, there was a lot of support for the idea. A lot of people quickly understood the, the enormity of the need that Sullivan County had and, and likely other counties. And out of the residue of that failed bill, uh, there's a very good likelihood that the state is going to set up a $50 million statewide nursing home fund using its ARPA, part of its share of the, the state's ARPA money. And I don't think that would have happened if not for all the attention and the discussions that led from that bill. And I think that bill was some ways related to the working group. So all of those conversations, I think, were extremely productive. And it, and it could result in quite a windfall for Sullivan County's taxpayers. So it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing when it all comes together. <laughs> I talked about Sullivan House before. So just a quick shot of the before and the after. I mean, the building looks phenomenal inside and out. It's been a great project. It's been a tough project. There's no, again, can't sugarcoat that either. Uh, the material delays, the cost increases, the scarcity of labor. I mean, it was an absolute nightmare, um, but we got through it. And, uh, you know, we had the governor here to come cut the ribbon. I thought that was pretty special. I know he doesn't get to this part of the state and he was with us like twice within a couple week period between the, his 603 visit where he ended at the Rotary dinner in Charlestown and then came back a couple weeks later for the ribbon cutting. Um, once we get the elevator sorted out, we'll get a certificate of occupancy. And that's really the only thing left. And unfortunately, like everything else, it's an old elevator. It's uh, out of, uh, the, the company went out of business. So getting parts is really difficult. And it's like everything's six weeks out. So, um, we're, but we're working through it. So I also talked about the HUD lead paint program. So that's, uh, we're about a third of the way through. We had a commitment to, to uh, get 60 housing units fully abated. We've done 19. We've got eight in progress and we have 15 awarded contracts that are just waiting on uh, some final scheduling from the contractors. So that's, that's pretty good news. That'll take us through the rest of this calendar year, I would think. So I would expect, barring any other unforeseen and unpleasant news, that we'd be, quick math in public, roughly two thirds of the way through with this by the end of calendar year 22. Um, the right hand side is a before and after of one of the very first projects that we did. 
Uh, it's a house in Claremont that where two young children had actually already been registered as being lead poisoned. So it just it underscores the, uh, the importance of this work and the long lasting positive impact it's gonna have in our communities. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, just a little photo op we did with Bar Harbor Bank across the street from the main office in Newport. They participated in our tax credit program. So that was a $108,000 award from the uh, New Hampshire Community Development Finance Authority. Uh, we still actually have $19,000 in tax credits to sell. So if anybody has any, uh, any money and they want to participate, we would certainly like to sell them some tax credits, which uh, provides a break on the New Hampshire business profits and business enterprise taxes. Uh, the sheriff's office uh, got into uh, some drone flying. Um, oh, I should have mentioned too, the, the red numbers at the top, the SG, those, those align with our three strategic goals. So in case you're wondering what SG 1, 2, or 3 means. Um, so that was pretty cool, the sheriff's effort with a lot of community support and a lot of grant uh, support from, from some uh, in, uh, business partners from our county helped make all that happen. And so Chief Deputy uh, Jamie Wilson has been the lead for that, but a lot of other players in the sheriff's office have gotten trained and uh, can, can take a whirl around. You see the infrared technology and the capability. That's really going to help with like search and rescue missions and supporting our local law enforcement agencies. Um, and you can see the bigger picture on the top right is, is the chief deputy very recently in the last couple weeks uh, sharing some information with our local police chiefs in the county. And then uh, I talked about Sugar River Region and some other related economic development activity. Um, we helped out the, the Newport Library Arts Center with the uh, Regional Arts Atlas that they worked on with the, the Lake Sunapee Chamber of Commerce and some other partners. And so that was pretty cool to see that all come together this past year. Uh, we applied for and received a couple of different USDA grants. One of them is what's helped bring the uh, Sugar River Region vision to life. Uh, we had a couple of uh, gatherings at the Common Man. We sent out a survey. We had about a thousand responses. So all these, all these things have been uh, very positive, very fun for our region and exciting about the future. We also used ARPA funding uh, in coordination with the delegation of the commissioners to do a couple of important things. A lot of it was geared towards uh, vaccine incentive payments, premium pay for those uh, eligible staff members, um, $500,000 for the county attorney to hire three uh, additional staff members, which uh, as of a couple weeks ago, our third person was hired, the, the victim witness advocate. So back in December, we hired the, uh, the office administrative person and the extra attorney. So uh, in, in the last few months, the Superior Court has switched from a part-time to a full-time court schedule. So it's been more important than ever for uh, County Attorney, attorney Hathaway to have those extra resources at his disposal. So it's been, it's been great uh, that, that you all made those resources available and he's taken full advantage of it. So that's, that's good news. The last couple projects that we used with the, uh, the ARPA funding was um, two contracts that we partnered with the Upper Valley Lake Sunapee Regional Planning Commission to do on our behalf. Uh, the first is the uh, Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy or the SEDS for short. Uh, our county's most recent SEDS was I think 15 years old. It was horribly out of date and it was, it was actually hurting uh, the municipalities in our county from going and getting infrastructure grants through the Economic Development Administration. So uh, they did a fantastic job. It's, it's kind of like in its last final draft run. It hasn't been submitted to the EDA for approval, but that's going to happen very soon. Uh, they, just, they did a fantastic job, so uh, it's a good news story. And the other project is a regional trails plan, which unfortunately they've had some personnel turnover. Those projects were being worked in parallel, but the one planner left, and the planner that's working the SEDS is now going to be working the trails plan. So those, he's had to put those in series, um, not in parallel. So it's going to take a little longer to get the trails plan done. But uh, we did have a pretty good start with the, with the previous gentleman who was on the staff. So i um, excited about that because it's going to be um, a lot of connectivity with the trails plan and the Sugar River region uh, work that we're doing. So it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. And then just other kind of catch-all. I put other awesome events because I didn't really have a category to put them in. On the far left, you see it was uh, the Spirit of Sullivan County is a KC-46 uh, that was named for, uh, for Sullivan County uh, out of the Pease Air National Guard uh, wing. And that was pretty cool. That was a lot of fun to get to walk through the planes. Um, <clears throat> they didn't let us autograph the side of it, which I was a little bummed about. I thought that would be kind of cool to, you know, <laughs> the, the security forces frowned on that. 
Um, in the middle, you see the sheriff and his team did a lot to support the community over this past year. This was through a food drive. So just good stuff in general. And then on the far right, um, Lionel uh, helped take the, uh, we have a kind of a nondescript looking pump house that's the home of our cidery operations in the fall because it's a water source. Otherwise, it's a very sterile looking concrete building. And so he had the idea of trying to jazz it up with a mural. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever, just go. And he's, I said, how much is it going to cost? And he said, not much. I said, all right. You know, and, and that, was all, that was the last thing we said. And I, didn't know, I had no idea what the plan was for it. And so when they did the unveiling, um, when I first saw it, I said, holy smokes, that thing is really cool. And as you drive in the county campus, if you look down to the right, if you just pass the cemetery, that thing really jumps out. And so very theme-oriented with the orchards, uh, since it's still the home of the cidery. But it was a lot of fun. And Lionel actually planned a lot of other activities. It was kind of, you know, it was back in September, right? It was one of the first, like, hey, let's have a gathering you know, post-COVID when it was still really hard to do those things. Uh, but we did that, and then we also dedicated a trail, uh, the, a Barrett Trail, named after former Commissioner Jeff Barrett, and that's Jeff there um, hanging out with his new sign. So some good fun. All right. And I guess now the part that's perhaps not as fun, <laughs> the FY23 budget highlights. So if you're following along with your hard copies, I'm on page 14. So big picture, we've got three themes, and I've talked a little bit, so I'll, I'll try to speed up a little bit. Uh, the first one was th those regional economic factors. What we saw with the impact, and are continuing to see, by the way, with just inflation and, and the cost of housing, the impact it's having on our staff, our ability to recruit new, new employees, and the ones that we're paying that are at the lower end of the wage scale. We have a starting uh, pay of $12.06 an hour for our grade two uh, group one employees, and we, you know, we found that that just doesn't work. Uh, it didn't shock anybody to see that the 55% vacancy rate that we have in our um, kitchen with the dietary workers and food service workers is because that they're in that group where the starting pay, if you have no experience, is 1206. Well, why would you come work for us for 1206 when you can go anywhere um, and with no experience and make at least 15? So um, that just, again, we knew we had to make an adjustment, but we had no idea that it was going to be of this magnitude and it was all going to happen so quickly. Um, the first budget that we produced, I say we, that was the county manager's budget, it had a 29% tax rate increase, which I knew wasn't going to fly, but that was based on an across the board pay raise. Uh, it was based on COLA, the way we've always done COLA, cost of living adjustment, uh, which is pegged to the December consumer price index. And it factored in some of the increases in food and electricity that we were projecting. And, and it was just obscene. Uh, and we also had to back out all the one-time COVID money that we had last year because we had no expectation that we were going to receive any of that this year. And it was a very, very ugly picture. It was a $4 million increase from the amount of property taxes that we had to raise last year. Uh, but through a little bit of good fortune and a lot of work from the commissioners and executive uh, finance committee, you know, we've been able to get that down. But... Uh, but it's, it's been tough. It's been tough. I mean, our, our reserve funds that we've historically tapped um, to help mitigate tax rate increases, they're, they're at their lower level. Um, and our variances in our current operating budget, so the, the extent that we're at or above revenue or hopefully below expenses, those, those numbers are shrinking. So everything's coming together to, uh, to make this a, a tough budget. As, as Commissioner Hebert mentioned, it was a real challenge. And uncertainty, again, I've alluded to this. The, we didn't have any expectation of having COVID funding. Last year's budget had a million dollars, roughly, of, of COVID money, whether it was from the CARES Act, the initial tranche of CARES Act funding, or the GOFER, where we were able to submit for eligible reimbursable expenses for, uh, for PPE and things like that. Uh, we got 259000 uh, returned to us. Uh, well, that, those programs were done. Once the emergency was over, the money went with it, uh, for the most part. And so that million-dollar hole in... You know, and this year's budget was, was something that we're like, well, how are we going to fill that? <laughs> um, I mentioned the variances that were very hard to predict. You know, our nursing home census has been down, and the Medicaid portion of our nursing home census is the thing that drives our pro-share payments, the proportional share, uh, the difference between Medicaid and Medicare rates. And historically, we've always relied on a pretty healthy pro-share to help us out. Well, when our census is down and our costs are down, we were expecting our pro-share payment to be down. And so we were really bracing for impact. And that's a black box formula. Uh, Ted can make his best guesses, but it really comes down to DHHS telling us what that number is going to be. And uh, we found out 
three weeks ago-ish, uh, what the number was going to be, and it was a very pleasant surprise. But up until then, we were sweating bullets. And so you're, we're building a budget back in February with no knowledge of what these numbers are going to be. Uh, it's, you know, there's not even a magic eight ball can help you in that scenario. So just a lot of uncertainty. And then the balancing act. And that's another thing Commissioner Hebert talked about. You know, we've got the taxpayers' equities and interests on one hand. We've got our staff on the other. And, of course, the residents that we serve, whether they're in the DOC or the nursing home. Um, and that's tough to limit the taxpayer burden but still do right by our employees when, you know, frankly, inflation and fuel costs and heating oil and everything else. I mean, we're all experiencing it, so I don't need to belabor that. But... Uh, but it's tough to try to find a single solution that satisfies everybody and everybody's happy. I mean, we know everybody's not happy uh, because we already know, again, Commissioner Hebert talked about maybe we didn't go far enough. We already know that the, the, the plans that we did to try to get this down to what we thought was a reasonable budget has left a lot of staff members unhappy. And frankly, that's a concern because they will vote with their feet. Um, and we won't know until they do. And so if I talk about it, it sounds like, it, you know, maybe it's like a a threat, <laughs> but I think it's a very real one that we have to be concerned about. Uh, we also have the needs of today and the needs of tomorrow. And on the, on the horizon tomorrow, obviously, is the nursing home. And if there's going to be a bond payment, that's also going to be a pretty significant investment that we need to be cognizant and mindful of and not uh, screw up next year's plans by, by getting crazy today. So it's just a big juggling act. And yes, they put pressure on the budget. Okay, so here's just another, doesn't really fit with the structure of the briefing, but it's just a, something we started to show. Uh, the equalized valuation, property values in the county are going up. I think that's awesome. Uh, they've really gone up, I mean, 23.6% last year. That's just phenomenal. 46.5% uh, in the last five years. Um, if you look at the chart from left to right, you got all the list of uh, the municipalities in the county. The equalized value, valuation, that number... Uh, just was published by DRA about a month ago. Um, so you can see our total equalized valuation at the bottom, and I apologize, the font, it's a total eye chart, is just over $6.8 billion. Uh, back in 2017, it was $4.6 billion. So we are growing. Um, you can see the local tax rates, uh, the next column, the 2020 tax rate, um, and then the 2020 valuation numbers. And then I just showed a percent change, a dollar change, and then just for grins, the, uh, the, the rank by the dollar change. Um, so there's a lot of growth in the county. Um, again, no surprise to anybody who's, um, who's been out and about. Um, when, you, when you factor in this equalized valuation number of $6.8 billion and our proposed property tax number of uh, $15.8 million, the average county tax rate is, is now down to $2.32 per $1,000. Of assessed, well, not assessed value. It's it's not a perfect uh, translation from e from equalized valuation to assessments, but it was 270 last year. Now it's 232. So, um, what all that means is our tax rates still not going up as much as our valuations are. Okay, now the uh, the top line summary slide for our 23 budget, just comparing the 22 final delegation numbers. So this does not include any of the supplemental appropriations that were done. Uh, we did one during the year to help out with some of the uh, uh, nursing home working group to get the, uh, the, the third-party cost estimate done. So this is just what was voted on at the convention compared to the commissioner's proposed. So you can see appropriations are up 4.25%, uh, non-property tax revenue. Uh, the other numbers, I don't need to go through all of them. Bottom line, uh, the property tax revenues are up 11.99%. So what that would mean for the hypothetical property owner uh, with a $250,000 house was that they'd have about $81 in additional county taxes based on those numbers. Uh, some other budget highlights. These two graphs, um, I think we, the picture we're trying to paint here is uh, the, the, the one of uncertainty. So the lower left graph is the uh, tax offsets. So this is whether it's from uh, the, the fiscal variances or fund balances or other money that we receive that we roll forward to, uh, to lower taxes in the subsequent budget year. You can see from 17 to 21, it was a fairly stable mix of the variances, which were the blue portion of the bar, and the, and, and the use of unassigned fund balance in the orange. But in 2022, we'd, we'd hit the lower limit of what our unassigned fund balance policy said we should use. So we couldn't use any more of the orange. The orange went away. And we didn't have many variances because our expense budget, we were only a couple percent uh, below our expense budget, and we just met revenues. So we didn't have a whole lot left over. 
But we did have a lot of unexpected COVID money, which is in that yellow bar. So that really saved our bacon back in 2022. Otherwise, it would have been a pretty significant reckoning last year, I think. Um, the final column on the right shows a decent return with variance with 900,000, um, 500,000 from the unassigned fund balance because it did actually bump up um, last year. And, and taking 500,000 actually is bringing us slightly below. Uh, I have another slide on that, so I'll, I'll kind of put a pin in that for now. And then taking 300,000 from the nursing home reserve fund just because nursing home revenues were down and we were trying to find ways, frankly, to find additional revenue sources to take some pressure off the taxes. So, uh, so we pinched 300,000 from there, which we felt like was an acceptable level of risk uh, because it still leaves 2 million uh, for the next couple of years if we're doing construction when we think we're really gonna need that fund. The right-hand box is the pro share revenue. And again, the trend was very stable and we had those two years where it was, un it was a very pleasant surprise. And that's when we thought, well, shoot, this is no problem. This is how we're gonna pay for the nursing home renovation. And then the wheels came off that pretty quickly and it bottomed out last year. And then this year, I said we were bracing for impact. And then and three weeks ago, when we got the number from DHHS, we almost fell out of our chairs and we, we realized that was about $400,000 more than what was budgeted. Completely unexpected. Um, but sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. So what's new in this budget? So I, I did talk about the wage increase. Originally, I had an across the board wage increase and it was just gonna be an unacceptable number. So we developed a more targeted policy that focused on the lower end of our wage scale, as well as specific jobs that were um, where the vacancy data supported a more um, nuanced increase, in particular the corrections officers in the jail. Um, so that's a big part of what's in this budget. We also reevaluated how we did COLA, the 5.9%. Um, is what we would have built in and in fact was in that original budget I referenced earlier. Uh, that was a huge number. Um, so in seeking the counsel of some of my counterparts across the state, it's like, well, what do you all do to help minimize these spikes? And so one of the suggestions was to use a three-year average. It just uh, softens some of those spikes. Uh, what it does mean is it doesn't mean that we're uh, not going to provide those funds to our employees. It just means it's gonna shift when those funds are made available because with a three-year average, if, if inflation ever gets back under control and gets, goes down to what it was in the last couple of years, which is like 1.4, 1.6%, well, if we're carrying two years of 5.9 and who knows what this year is gonna be, but it's probably gonna be pretty big, we will be building in a number higher than the one-year number would suggest. And so my hope is that we are consistent with this and we didn't just change to this out of convenience um, and then we're gonna go back to the one year when it suits us because that will hurt our staff. Uh, this, this fact alone has probably been the number one source of negative feedback from our staff members is, hey, we're getting screwed. You gotta be kidding me with 3.1%. Have you seen what's going on? And it's like, yes, we do understand. This is not the message you wanted to hear, but again, that balancing act of taxpayer interests and just the realities of trying to build a budget that we think is gonna pass, um, that hurts. Uh, there's no, there are no two ways around that. Uh, we've also tried to uh, address something that's, I think, important, but it exceeds the, ca the capabilities of the people who have been writing grants, which frankly has been me and Penelope. Uh, we were the architects of those two USDA grants, and that was awesome. But at the end of the day, it was like $50,000 that we got from USDA. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of staff hours we had tied up in that. It's just an unacceptable trade-off for what the things I should be doing and Penelope should be doing. So the uh, thought with this is that we'll do it on an a la carte basis. So we might not even spend all this money, but if we can identify an opportunity, find a grant writer who will take it on for us. Uh, the world of grant writing is pretty squirrely. There's a reason why there's not many of them around. They, they typically don't get paid until the grant is awarded. So the thought with this is we'll pay some money for the effort and maybe have another bonus, if you will, if the grant's accepted. And that way, hopefully people will wanna take this work on for us. And then we can make it available to the entire county. Um, I think that's important too. There's a lot of municipalities that lack this capacity. They just don't have full-time or even part-time staff uh, working for their select boards. And so they're really at a loss as to how to take advantage of uh, a lot of the opportunities that are frankly out there right now. So we, we think this is another way the county can help. And also we've got you know the SEDS, the Sugar River Region stuff, the trails uh, program going on. There's a lot of opportunities that are emerging and we frankly just don't have a way to, to, to reach out and capitalize it. This would help us do that. And the last thing is a, uh, trying to make a transition to a full-fledged finance department. Um, this 
would add one full-time position in the, uh, the business office of the nursing home. They've actually experienced some difficulties keeping up with billing because over the last couple years, in addition to everything else, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services changed a lot of their billing processes and it's been a nightmare. And so our accounts receivable has ballooned from what was traditionally closer to a million or a million two to closer to two million. And so that just takes time to go track down and you're dealing with insurance companies and software systems and it's just, it's a pain and you know, Lewis is great at trying to keep up with it, but having another position would, uh, would help even more. Uh, and that helps with the county's cash flow situation. But um, this is, we're the only county that ha doesn't have a, a separate independent finance department. Uh, frankly, it would free up a lot of uh, my time as well uh, for some of the other programs that we're running. So I think that's an important one is in addition. Um, so we talk about the personnel costs. Again, this is a, a regurgitation of a slide, but I think it's important to reemphasize that you know, we are in the people business. We've got great people, but it's heavily regulated between the nursing home and the jail. There are just things that you cannot cut corners on. Uh, Commissioner Hebert said we can't charge the or raise the prices of the things that we, that we do for our services. Um, nor can we just lay people off when times are tough. Uh, it just doesn't work that way in long-term care or in corrections. So the top box just shows all of the people cost uh, lines in our budget, starting with salary, ending with dental insurance, and everything in between. And when you add those up for uh, the, the amount of staff that we have that are built into this budget, it's just uh, 20, 21 and three quarters million dollars. It's a lot of money. If you take our total budget, of 35.8 million and subtract uh, things that I, I like to refer to as that are not a part of our operating uh, mission set. So the human services budget, that's just a, that's a check that we write to the state to be part of the long-term care in New Hampshire. Uh, the community grants, uh, UNH cooperative extension and our bonded debt, which I go back and forth on whether I should, I should include that or not, but it doesn't make a huge difference in the total number. But if you take the 21 million and divide it by the 29 million, um, our personnel, is roughly three quarters of our total budget. So you think about, well, what, what's discretionary? Where can we cut? If we really can't cut people, um, what can we cut? Well, you look at what else it takes to run a county, and it's a lot of things that are, I wouldn't call discretionary. I mean, it's things like food, which we have to buy that, and, and we expect that's going up about 10% this year. We have service contracts. We have some of our Medicare Part A, Part B services. We've got nursing medical supplies. Uh, we're always trying to innovate and find uh, less expensive but similar quality substitutes for the things that we use, but it's just, it's tough. And if we do, it saves a little bit, but not enough to really make a huge dent in, in that overall $35 million budget. Uh, electricity, we're anticipating to go up 50% this year. Our current service agreement, we are getting electrical uh, electricity supply at 7.3 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, the current pricing is closer to 11 and our agreement expires in November. So between now and November, we have to sign up for a new agreement. So we're trying to find the best way to take this thing out of that. Um, so anyway, a lot of other stuff, computers, phones, uh, biomass fuel. I mean, these things are, there's nothing that we can just say, well, we can just slash that. We don't really need that. That's a nice to have, not a must have. And so that comprises a little over 5 million. There's just not a lot left over. Um, I mentioned the variances. So we, we use those to help offset taxes the uncertainty I've talked about, I don't think I need to, to beat that dead horse anymore. Uh, I will go, let me go back. We did get some unexpected one-time payments with the nursing home. So as of about six weeks ago, we were expecting to be about $900,000 under our expense budget and about $900,000 under our nursing home revenue budget. And I, I was thinking they were just gonna cancel each other out. Um, we did receive, between the unexpected news of the pro share and a, another uh, one-time payment um, from the state that came through Gopher uh, and another payment that I think was related to the 6.2% for the FMAP, we actually almost negated the revenue loss um, in the nursing home. So it did help us uh, leverage the a variance in our expense budget. So that was great news, but again, very unexpected. So I talked about the expense budget and the revenue budget. Yeah, I, I guess I'm getting a little ahead of myself. That's the, the, the curse of rehearsing is I'm saying everything on here without having info on the slide. Um, use of fund balances. We have 1.7 million built into this budget um, through our different fund balances. We talked about the 900,000 from the 22 fiscal variance. 500,000 I've also discussed from unassigned fund balance. It does take us a little bit below that lower level, but we just thought that was a prudent thing to do. 
uh, given all the challenges that we had building this budget. And I also talked about the Nursing Home Reserve Fund. Again, minimal risk. I think it leaves $2 million for future requirements, uh, which I think during the renovation, we're going to need this money to help plug any other potential revenue holes. And now the, the standard um, bar charts, just to give you another way of expressing our um, elements of this budget. This is the expense side. So you can see by far $16 million, uh, is in the nursing home. Uh, the next biggest expense category is that human services budget. Again, it's not really anything to do with county operations. It's just a check that we write to the state or a series of checks. I guess that's paid either monthly or quarterly. Um, and then corrections is the next biggest department and the rest of it fairly explanatory. Uh, revenue, the number one category is nursing home revenues followed by property tax revenues. And then you can see the, uh, the variance offset is the number three. The number four is our unassigned fund balance offset. Um, and again, the rest by the different departments. And this is a drill down into the nursing home revenue. So you can see what is expected to come from Medicaid, come from ProShare, uh, Medicaid assessment, private pay, et cetera, and the various Medicare and insurance programs. Uh, the next part of the budget is uh, talking about our capital, uh, capital funds. So this is a very brief summary about what we have planned for capital projects and transfers to reserves. The first four line items are the uh, standing reserves, well, the first three, I should say. So we do 100000 a year for sheriff's vehicles. That used to be seventy, but with the cost increase in vehicles and the switch from sedans to SUVs, we bumped that up to 100 a couple years ago. This year, we had to change the other vehicles and equipment from 40 to 60. And that's, again, a reflection of, uh, actually, Mary Burke, our, our facilities and ops director, did a, did a nice job plotting out all of our other vehicles and equipment requirements over the next 10 years. And what we did when we realized that was when the, the annual contribution for those life cycle requirements was that we needed to bump that up from 40 to 60. Then our standard 40,000 transfer for the next time we have a 27 pay period year. Um, the rest are some projects. So we have a DOC HVAC controls. It was a phase two. We did phase one last year. Um, we've got 100,000 for uh, Newport to relocate a boiler, uh, which is in the basement of the Opera House. And so we just want to get that on our side of the building. And uh, that's going to be a pretty complicated project, very labor intensive, because it's going to involve a lot of repiping and plumbing of the, uh, the chilled water lines that go from the cooling tower, which is on the roof above the sheriff's office, uh, back to that boiler. Associated with that is the propane tank, which feeds that boiler, which was 15 years ago buried in the parking lot in that little cubby hole between the opera house, the old courthouse, and the building next door, which is not on county property. So the town of Newport has a project next year. They're going to be repaving that parking lot, and they asked us if we would kindly remove and relocate that propane tank. So that's also part of that. Uh, there's an electrical upgrade in Unity, uh, the next item for 50000 that's the Southwest Mutual Aid line that we think is helping, uh, contributing to an overload circuit condition, which is making things difficult in the nursing home. We're trying to minimize this because with the renovation project, uh, these wouldn't necessarily be great investments, but they're things that just can't wait, uh, whether it's a safety problem when you're talking about electrical systems um, or then in the case of the next one, HVAC retrofits on Stearns 1, 2, and 3. Uh, it becomes a quality of life issue for the staff and residents. We also have our ongoing equipment replacements for um, washing tubs, which will be reused. Uh, we'll buy them now and, and certainly keep, keep them and reuse them after the renovation if it's approved. And the same thing with our washers. And then separately, I have the dump truck not part of the 600000 plan because that's being taken from Capital Reserve as part of that other vehicles and equipment money that we set aside. This is just a quick uh, graph showing what's in capital reserves. This is an unaudited slide, so this is subject to confirmation and change by our auditors this summer. But it just shows that we have a little over five million set aside for projects. Uh, this is factoring in the six hundred thousand that the uh, delegation voted on recently to restore that was included in the twenty-two budget, and you can see the other categories there and their their dollar figures. This is the slide for our our, our community grants. And what emerged from the day of meetings that we had with all of the partner organizations that made requests. So I'll just let, let you have a couple minutes to look at that. 
You can see the organizations and the total dollar amount is 235000 I know it's hot. We're almost done. Uh, this is another standard slide um, showing the history of fund balance from the gory days of the early uh, mid-2000s when we were in red uh, to when we had a lot of fund balance and how we drew that down. Um, our target that's set by policy is about $3.1 million. Uh, you, you can't see it because of the fidelity of the thickness of the, of the lines, but I do expect we'll be a little bit under. I've got that in hatch because that's a prediction, according to me, again, subject to validation by the auditors. Um, I think it'll be close, and again, that's why it, I think it's a minimal amount of risk to dip uh, 500000 out of here to help keep taxes down this year. This is a slide we've shown since I started, so I'm not going to belabor that. And this last one is um, also one that's been shown in the past. I think last year was the first year I added the blue line, which would show what a Consistent. I think last year I used a one and a quarter percent. This year I used a one and a half percent reference line. If we just had a slow, steady one and a half percent per year growth from 2011 until now, we'd be within $100,000 um, of where we are with this proposed budget in terms of the property tax amount that needs to be raised. So I guess uh, slow and steady wins, wins the race. Um, and then the comparison of how much taxes have increased versus inflation over the same period. We're still, we're still doing pretty good to be about 10% under. I think in the past it's been as much as like 14% under, but that's just a, not a very sustainable um, thing to keep up with, but we're still doing pretty good, I think. And I know this kind of leads into the next agenda item for that, but I, okay. I, if there's any questions, I guess. Um, yeah, and I'll let, I mean, I'll say you or Commissioner Heber, since it's your budget, and uh, when we get done, then we go back to the other portion of our meeting. Okay. Uh, um, item number five, but we're sort of, right now, we did the presentation on item number three, so now we're open for public comment from the delegation and members of the public in attendance. Thank you. For Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, our Representative Smith has a question, and I don't know if you want to run it, you can recognize people, Commissioner, he might get easier to like this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What's the dump truck for? Well, ours is pretty much falling apart. The truck, it's, the truck itself is, is to a point where it's just rusting through and, you know, it, it runs. But they use it for um, just stuff around the nursing home and the DOC. Plowing and sanding. Plowing and sanding and, okay. and uh, things like that. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Yep. Yeah. On a follow-up to his, are you guys planning on purchasing a used Dump truck or new one? We do look at we do look at used uh, um, if we can find a good deal on a, a good used one. Um, we look at both options, but we try to keep it as you know, get get the best deal we can for what we're after. Municipalities get state bid on vehicles, so they buy them reasonable. Sometimes going used isn't the way to go because with state bid, you for very little more money you get brand new which gives you uh, at least three years of a warranty mm -hmm. they represent, okay yeah you can recognize them if you want to smith isn't it? okay thanks uh the trails plan is there a map of all the trails in the county and what they can be used for i'll let benny answer that one if you have the answer to that sure there, there isn't now Okay. That's why we have this project, because we think that's one of the greatest amenities that the county offers to residents. Thank so you. We want to have all that data. I don't know. I guess if members of the delegation are done, I don't recognize members of the public. Commissioner mm -hmm. Hebert, yeah. is that still your show? So, I'm going to reach out May I? interrupt for a second. I'd like to just move this microphone for so that we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are others. Is everybody there?
A, a grant, uh, that, yeah, and um, and we're not in the budget this year, and I completely get how hard this is for you guys, and and don't want to don't disagree with whatever decision process you had to, to go through, but I do want to just make that sort of statement that I think uh, I think we would really like to be involved in working with the county in the next year around long-term care and how the our organization and can help maybe work with the continuum of care that might help save the county money. So what we had asked for was money to help family caregivers, staff to enhance our staff. So we we lost money that was supposed to come into the county to family family caregivers in this county because we didn't have enough staff to be to get um, those grants made to people. Um, and so I, I don't want to see that happen again, but that's only a little piece of the bigger picture that the county has to deal with, which is, you know, revenue for the nursing home depends on, so, so, so our organization, which provides um, the Choices for Independence program, so home and community-based care services in Sullivan County, and provides care coordination for veterans in Sullivan County and provides support. I just, I think if we could work together, um, I would love, just appreciate that opportunity. So I don't know if that's something you can help make happen. And I honestly, we haven't even talked about it before. So it's no, just wanted to, I feel like it's very important that the county can work with organizations that are getting state and federal funding that are coming, that's coming into this county and that we can we can try to leverage it better. So that's my request. Well, consider that uh, Thank you. another meeting, OK? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Um, OK, yes, sir. Representative Spielberg. Thank you. Uh, I am looking for the uh, figure on personnel costs, 21752000 But what I can't find in here is what's the incremental increase in personnel costs using that same aggregate, FY22 to FY23. I don't have that off the top of my head. I, I know there's more factors than just the wage increase. Um, Sure. And then there's the multiplying effect of what the wage increase does to New Hampshire retirement and FICA and some of those other things that have um, that are all formulaic. So I could I could get that. I just yeah, I don't I, I'm just thinking uh, as the EFC sits down on Thursday morning, it would be good to have a breakout. And as you say, it's not just wage increase, but if we could get it broken down on each of these components of the personnel costs, I think that's going to be an important thing to see. Yeah. Yeah, that all broken down. Have you had a meeting yet? Have you had an EFC meeting yet? We will be meeting on Thursday morning. Right Anybody else? Back to you, Representative. So I'll take it back from you if you don't mind. No, nope, that's Peter. fine. Okay, so the county manager, County Commissioner Osgood, has anything? Uh, okay, then I uh, am going to, as I said, turn it back over to me and we will go to item uh, number five on the agenda. Set the c county convention date and time to vote on the fiscal year 2022 county budget per RSA 24 21 dash A3. 
and this has to take place 28 days after the mailing of the MS-46, which was done on May 27th. So, in other words, as I understand, and as a correct, the earliest date we could have it is June 24th. Is that correct, Manager Ferron? Okay, so that means that now it's, that's, a, that's a Friday, correct? So if, if we wanted to, we could meet as early as then, but I'm not sure with all due respect to the EFC whether they'll be ready. So um, yeah, that would be that would be a Friday. It would be a week from this coming Friday. June 24th. Uh, to to vote on the county budget. I'm just asking if it. No, we. No, okay, you're not ready. We do, what, what date is that? Okay, that's the earliest. I'm just giving you the. No, re no we'll not be ready. Okay, all right. So, and actually, the range, and I want to be clear, the range is between June 24th and June 30th. Okay. So, we have to vote sometime during that deadline. I just want to be clear in setting the schedule because uh, we've got to decide on the schedule. So, it's June 30th, a Thursday? Yes, a Thursday. That is correct. And I would push for that. Okay, uh, but I did talk with the county manager something about with payroll. There may be a problem if we did it Thursday, the 30th. Um, I mean, yeah, we're, we're crossing over from, from fiscal years, and then with the 4th of July holiday being on that Monday, it leaves a short week to, to process payroll. So if we could do it no later than Wednesday, that would be great. If we have to do it on Thursday, that's fine. We'll make it happen. It's just okay. I mean, it's a, it's a tricky period with a three-day weekend coming up right after that. Okay. Um, and I, I talked about possibly, so do you really, I mean, if we could met thir uh, Wednesday the 29th, how would that be? Well, not as good. <laughs> okay. So, um, first of all, maybe you ought to check to see who's a victim. I realize not everybody is here, and hopefully Representative Stapleton is listening, because we need a quorum, and I'd like all members of the delegation present. I, I don't know whether I'll get them all, but... Uh, how many of you can make a meeting on, uh, we'll say, Wednesday, June 29th? Okay. 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 All right. Well, most everybody except for Representative Spillsbury and Representative Tanner? You can't. Okay. What about, all right, we'll try for Thursday the 30th. Uh, that's fun for me. Okay. So it sounds like that represents Silbury and Tanner. You can't make that either, either the 29th or the 30th. I just uh, the Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, Representative Stapleton, I'm sorry. You have your hand raised. What about your availability? I'm having trouble understanding. Uh, you can't hear it. Uh, Representative Stapleton, could you put. for uh, either the 29th or the 30th. Okay. Okay, so what, what date is better for you? The 29th. The 29th. 29th was better, but I can make either date. Okay. All right. So, um, are either Monday or Tuesday an option? Um, I, we won't be ready. We will have met the 24th and 27th. Mm. 27th. Mm. We could be ready. Well, if we make any changes and anything has to be done for the presentation, mm -hmm. we're pushing it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Just okay. So you think it would be just too soon to meet either the Monday, the twenty seventh. Or Tuesday, Hi. Tuesday the twenty eighth. Sharon, when do when do I have meetings scheduled? Sixteenth, twenty fourth, and if necessary, the twenty seventh. Yeah. Which is Thursday, Friday, and Monday. Sixteenth, twenty fourth, and twenty You know, we'll either be ready or we won't be ready. So I, as far as I'm concerned, just go ahead and schedule it. Okay, so, so you can't make either of the either the Wednesday the 29th or Thursday the 30th? Yeah. Yes, I can. Oh, okay, I can. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I'm the problem child, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. um, and, and Linda and Representative yeah, Tanner. Yeah, Representative Tanner is going to be a problem. Um, 
So, um, are you here the 28th? I can be. Tuesday the 28th. What the hell's the 28th for you? Um, I think that would be hard also. We're leaving that afternoon, so yeah, it's it's tough. You did say it could be during the day. It, it could be during, could, during the day. I don't think we've always, we've done it in the evening. Of course, some of us work, but I'm, I have a pretty flexible schedule. Because Representative Rollins, I'm concerned if you could get time off. I don't know Representative O'Hearn, and I don't know who else. Well, we all have to get time off. Right, yeah, and, and I, I will be as flexible as possible. I mean, I have a pretty flexible schedule, so I'm open to anything, but I've got to get a quorum. Mr. Chair? Yeah. Um, Sharon. Sharon, sure. yes. Um, so I pulled up the notice that shows Thursday, June 16th, Friday, June 24th, at 9 a.m., and then Monday, June 27th, as needed. On the well, it's probably, yeah, since our other one didn't work, it may well be needed, so <laughs> we'll see. Uh, yeah. So, would we, do we, would be we willing to it be meeting in the day, uh, help at all, Representative Spilsbury, for, with your situation? Or Tuesday daytime would be great. Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday Tuesday during the daytime. Work. All right, okay. Tuesday night doesn't work. I, I had a plan to be departing late in the day on <laughs> right, Tuesday, yeah, and I, I yeah, will we, massage right, Tuesday to whatever is decided. Sure, and, and okay. So could we do Tuesday the 28th, say, I don't know, in the early 1 p.m.? Is that, raise your hand? Okay. So is everybody, as I said, Representative Smith, it's okay with you? Representative Aaron? Okay. Safe thing. Safe thing. Safe thing. Safe thing. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Representative Stapleton, please. Uh, Representative Stapleton, uh, yeah. 28th is good for me. Any time during the day. Uh, Representative Smith, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you're you're pretty flexible, which you know. But of course, that's yeah. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, so, is there any objection to doing Tuesday the 28th at 1 p.m.? Now, I don't know. I was thinking of having in Claremont, but maybe I don't know whether it'd be the school tech center would be available. You might check that. Uh, if they're not available, either have it here or have it at the third floor probate courtroom. Okay? And uh, so we'll try Tuesday the 28th. Um, I appreciate your uh, flexibility, Representative Gottlieb. No, I know it's not very flexible, but thank you for the appreciation. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I understand, Chris. I do want, to, you know, I, I, I'm important of trying to get some sort of budget passed, and I. I think the 28th is, you know, obviously you've got a lot of work to do, but I hate to wait till the last minute, too. So I'm trying to balance everything here. So we'll, of course, the other thing, hopefully the others who are not here will be able to attend as well. But Tuesday, June 28th at 1 p.m., a, uh, a place to be determined. Yep. Okay? All right. So we all clear. Tu Thank again, you. Tuesday the 28th at 1 p.m. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, okay, now I'm going to go on to the item, and the item number six, as you may have noticed, is sort of a dead subject. That's the transfer lease of, of the um, valid interest in real property owned by the county. This is involving New Hampshire DOT, the flow, re, flowage release, ditching and draining on the second New Hampshire turnpike per RSA 28 colon 8 dash C. Uh, so it basically is a dead subject, and that's why I have removed it from the agenda based on advice from the county manager. So are there any questions about this? Uh, we have, I think, Wine will shoot the National Resources Director if anybody wanted to get into it, but if we're all set with that, I, I'd rather move on if possible. Okay, uh, next item, item number seven. Revised sheriff fee schedule, RSA 104 colon 31 dash XI. What I need, because it was tabled from our last meeting of May 17th, I need a motion 
to take this item off the table, please. And then we will have a vote, and if it passes, we can consider the item. Representative Smith, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move uh, that uh, this item be taken from the table. Okay, thank you. A motion by Representative, a second by Representative Oxingham to take this item off the table. Are we ready for the vote? Is a voice vote okay? No, yes. because we have Zoom. What's that? Oh, we have Zoom. Uh, thank you very much, Representative O'Hearn, for reminding me, because we are on Zoom, and at least one delegation member, I don't think anybody else, uh, Representative Stapleton, we will have to have a roll call vote. So whenever the clerk is ready, will the clerk please call the roll? Representative Aaron. Here, Representative Gottwin. Yes. Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Oxingham. Yes. Representative Rollins. Yes. Representative Smith. Yes. Representative Spillsbury. Yes. Representative Stapleton. Yes. <laughs> Representative Tanner. Yes. And the chair votes. Uh, yes. And yes, and no, so the motion carries. Okay, thank you. Welcome, uh, Sheriff Simons, uh, the High Sheriff. If you could please come forward and, uh, as I said, uh, go over this and answer any questions the delegation has, please. And welcome. Happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, John Simons, the County Sheriff. Uh, thank you for allowing us to put on the agenda for this evening. I don't think we have uh, a mic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you get started and then. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Okay, thank you, Representative O'Hearn, for pointing that out. Okay, uh, again, thank you for allowing this to be put on your agenda for this evening. I apologize for the uh, confusion in the last time that this was on your agenda. Uh, so as you know, the fees uh, for the work that the Sheriff's Office does for the service of, of all the civil paperwork that we do is set by statute. Uh, historically, it's been set by the legislature. I don't recall how many years that's done, but it's we received that notice that the fees have been changed. Uh, effective July 1st of 2021, the legislature revised the statute uh, in its RSA 104 colon 31, the fees of sheriffs and deputy sheriffs. And if I may, if, uh, I'd like to read that to you. Okay, sure. Uh, so the revised uh, statute is the fees of sheriffs and deputy sheriffs specified in paragraph one through five in paragraphs 7 through 9b may be increased once annually by a vote of the county convention, and the total increase shall not exceed the consumer price index for all urban consumers. The Northeast regions published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the United States Department of Labor, using the amount published for the month of June in the year prior to the start of the fiscal year on a percentage basis. So the consumer price index Northeast region June 2021 numbers uh, for that particular month, which is now set by statute, is the number we need to go with, uh, was a 1% increase for the month. The increase for the total year was 4.6, but uh, that you're reading June. Uh, the request for the increase in fees is just the 1% for the month of June. Uh, I have an explanation here for what that increase will be for the fees. So as you go through, I've kind of summarized what each one of these things uh, are in paragraphs one through five. Uh, the writs, so in paragraph one, the writs, the demand for rent, eviction notices, small claims processes, and notice of executions, as well as subpoenas, would go from $30 to $30.30. So it's it merely a 30 cent increase. Uh, anything that's labeled as you go down through here is from $30 goes to, goes, uh, to 30 cents as an increase. Uh, restraining orders are, are $36, will go up to $36.36. A bulky attachment, again, $30, uh, $30.30. Uh, the mileage on the federal rate is what we've always gone with. Uh, it's currently at 58.5 cents. It only goes up a half a cent to 59 cents. Uh, filing a recording and registration of deeds. Filing a recording at the registration of deeds is $30, will go to $30.30. Uh, the writs of attachment with petitions, or the writ of summons with a petition, again, up 30 cents. A non-est return, which you may see in the statute there, just means that the uh, attempt to service was uh, unable to be done because the person we were looking for is not in our jurisdiction. That is a $12 fee uh, that goes up 12 cents, $12.12. .12. Civil orders of arrest, 
up 30 cents, uh, and an in-hand service goes from $60 to $60.60. So as you can see, I mean, they're very minor increases. Um, eight of the 10 counties so far, as I understand it today, have voted to make these increases. I think Hillsborough County and Sullivan County are the last two. Um, again, it's, it's not major increases. As I've looked at our costs, had this increase happened last year, uh, June 21 to today, it would have only been an increase in revenue of $488. Uh, the problem with not increasing is, is the cost for, to do the service increases, and we're not recouping at least a very minor amount of that on the other side. So 30 cents, is, 30 cents to 36 cents is the maximum increase in these. Okay. Okay, thank you, Sheriff. Questions from the delegation of the Sheriff? Right. Any questions? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. 1% okay, is a yes, small sorry. amount, and I take your point that you don't want to leave it on the table, otherwise you, you lose it over time. But I just want to make sure I understand this. So it can't exceed the consumer price index published for the month of June in the year prior to the start of the fiscal year. So you're looking back to June 2021. Correct. But when you look back to June 2021, are you looking then for a one-month increase or a one-year increase? So What's the increase would go annually. So it would be an, an increase beginning July 1st of this year up so, to next year. So, so I think the distinction I'm looking for is what's the difference between the 1.0% that you refer to and the 46 the 4.6 was the increase over the over the course of the year. If you look at the, the following year, the document nope, for 2021 for the, the documentation that I have from uh, the CPI yeah. uh, showed a a 12 month increase was 4.6, uh, but there were different increases over the course of the months. There was an increase in of different numbers in each month, but the legislature clearly meant it for only June, uh, as it's written in the statute, only June of the year prior. That's the month we have to go with. Okay, sorry to sound dense, but to circle back and ask my question then again. Sure. Are you saying that you're only taking as much as it increased in a single month? I don't think that's what the <laughs> No, it's a 1% increase for all of those fees. So as we continue for the next 12 months, yeah. it will be a 1% uh, increase on all of those fees. That I get that. Over the, I, over I guess what I don't get is I don't get why it's not 4.6. I would have to tell you it's... Hmm? It, it, it may have been a very bad decision, but that was the legislature's <laughs> imposition of a cap. Correct. Oh. Yeah, I would probably tend to agree with Rep. Lott. It's the way we write the laws. So I will tell you that uh, this is not the first time that question came up. I understand it also came up in Grafton County. They wanted the 4.6, but the statute is very clear that it has to be June. The increase that well, was if, if I'm in understanding June. you correctly, it sounds unintended. I don't think they could have meant you take the increase for a single month. I think that they meant the increase for a year ending in that month. Which was 1%. Then what's the 4.6? I don't know. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. the man manager so, from it. Help. Offer, if this is related to that way we used to do COLA, and every month they publish a rolling 12-month number, and then the individual contribution of that month by itself, which is then factored into the rolling 12-month it's not clear which number they indicated, but there are two numbers that are published every month. So I, that's that is exactly correct. I could see it enough wiggle room to interpret it to take the four point six. And if I'm understanding <laughs> what's been said, the one point zero is the increase that occurred in that month, and the four point six is the cumulative increase over the twelve months preceding that month. And I can't believe that the legislature didn't intend to use the latter, but. I can tell you that this is an interesting question about legislative intent. I can tell you that as I look at the CIP, uh, March for 2021, March was a 0.6 percent. April was 0.7. May was 0.6. Jo uh, June, as I said, was 1.0. 0.2 for July. 0.1 for August. 0.3 for September. October was 0.6. November 0.6 and December 0.2. So why they picked June, I, I could not tell you. It's the highest. Hmm. Okay, further, okay, is that anything else for us? Uh, still very okay. Any other questions of the sheriff, high sheriff from the delegation? Are there any other questions? 
All right, okay, so I will now uh, entertain a motion to approve uh, these uh, revised sheriff fees. Uh, yes, Representative Smith, please. I move to approve the changes to the fee schedule. Okay. All right, as as recommended by the sheriff. As right. recommended by the sheriff. Okay, that's a, okay, thank you, Representative Smith. Do I have a second on that motion? Second hit. Second by Representative Rollins. Second. Yes, uh, yes, Representative State, okay. Yes. Okay, are we ready for the vote? Any uh, further questions or discussions? Okay, do we, uh, obviously we're going to have a roll call vote because again, we're doing this by Zoom. So whenever the clerk is ready, if the clerk could please call the roll. Representative Barron. Yes. Representative Gutlin. Yes. Representative O'Hearn votes yes. Representative Oxingham. Yes. Representative Rollins. Yes. Representative Smith. Yes. Representative Pillsbury. Yes. Representative Stapleton. Re yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Representative, Representative Container. Yes. And the clerk of uh, the, the chair vote. Uh, yes. Okay, and the motion passes. Congratulations, Sheriff. Thank you for coming. Okay, the next item, uh, and this is review and ratification of the March 2nd, 2002 Sullivan County Work Group, and also something about EFC m minutes, and also the review. Okay, yeah, and so I guess it's both. The, both of those or. Uh, bodies met on the same day and I don't know represent Gottling were you at that meeting on March 2nd I don't think I was but and I don't know this is more of a vote among I the members I was present members okay. uh, and I, I want we can turn it over have but it basically a mem members of the two subcommittee more or less should be voting on their minutes I move we accept the minutes. Okay. Representative Aaron made a motion. Uh, Representative Gottlieb, or she what? wants to move on the on both. That's fine. Okay. And I need a should be a second from. Second okay. I think so, it's a member from the second. EFC or work group. Okay. You 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 second that. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, Representative Gottlieb. I'm just trying to get some of these minutes off our table. Okay. So I'll go ahead. Do you call for the vote, Representative Gottlieb? Because Representative Sullivan is not here, he's chair of the work group, so. Oh. I have to call for the vote. Well, you sh the members should, I'm doing this a courtesy, yeah, vote among for to approve these minutes of March 2nd. Oh. Okay. I guess I'm wondering why the Finance Committee and well, it's very confusing. It was a joint, uh, joint meeting, meeting, I it's think. A joint meeting, I wasn't right, there, so. Right, yeah. Uh, and, and just to be clear, Representative Merchant, well, I guess, I don't think he was at that meeting, so he abstains. Yes. Oh, no, he was and there. Oh, he was there. Okay, we I guess it's present, okay the next meeting. He was Sorry. there via Zoom. <laughs> okay. And, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just, uh, you want me just call for the vote. Just all Is those. It, all of, it'll only be the members of the. Uh, okay. Uh, I can't. That, that's just so weird. Um, okay. So Representative Rollins. Yes. Representative Aaron. Yes. Are the we, because are of we, Zoom, you got to call the roll. We, I'm sorry. Did we move both meeting minutes, March 2nd and May 9th? This is March 2nd okay, right now, yeah. Representative Barrett. Yes, I vote. Okay, we're just doing March 2nd. Okay. And it's, it's me. And Representative Gottman. Yes. Is that it for the... Tanner. Representative Tanner. Yes. And Pillsbury. And Representative Pillsbury. Yes. Five yeses, no noes. Can I have okay. those back so I can see what I vote no. on? Okay, I think Representative Raw, you're on that committee, or you weren't there. Okay. But it's passed unanimously. Thank you, Representative O'Hearn. All right, next I am reviewing ratification of the May 9th, 2022 Sullivan County Work Group minutes. Um, I know I took the minutes, but I'm not a voting member, just for you. I hope you should have a copy members of at least the work group. That's when we met with Gopher via Zoom. Yes. 
I move we accept the minutes. Okay. Um, okay. I, I'm okay. Do I have a second on that motion? I'm, I'm technically a non ex officio, so I'm just going running it, but I'm not going to vote. Second, the members of, of the work group. Someone who, who is there. Anybody else on the work group? Uh, okay. Uh, Representative Rollins, would you mind making? I think you were there at this May 9th meeting. Uh, yes. Okay, all right. So you'll second it. Okay, I'll second Re it. Representative Aaron, second by <clears throat> Representative Rollins to accept these minutes. Okay, so I'm just, as I said, I'm, but I'm not going to vote. All, the, I'm, all those in favor of approving these minutes signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. those opposed say nay. Oh, all right, the ayes have it, and I can sign this. So. All right, thank you very much. Now, the next thing is the review and ratification of the May 13th and May 17th 2022 EFC minutes. I don't know if those are you're ready for a vote, Representative Gottlieb, on those minutes. We can yes. do it as a oh, block. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this is fine. If everybody yeah. is ready. Yeah. So you, I guess again it would be among the members of the EFC case. Okay. Uh, do you want do you want the list? I have Okay. We got a, <coughs> I move we'll that we approve the uh, minutes of the EFC meeting on Friday, May 13th. And I could have a second from. And 17th, do it as a block. Pardon me? Can you do it as a block? The two meetings all in one vote? Sure. No, one's delegation and one is EFC, I think. Am I correct? Yeah. Do you want a second? I think they were both EFC meetings, um, but I was not present at the first. I was present at the second. I second. Oh, oh it was. Oh, it this, was a this was a continuation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was a recess. And yeah, so it's not two separate. Two you began the second. I second. I get that. Who seconded? Aaron. Yeah. Representative Aaron. Thank you, Representative Aaron. I can't see you, but thank you. You want to go ahead and so it's going to be these and then no no yeah just those and then we will be adding representative Spilsbury. all right so it should be five members of the EFC. Right. okay yeah yeah uh, okay. representative Aaron Yes. Representative Tanner. Yes. Representative Gottman. Yes. Uh, Representative Spilberry. Yes. And Representative Merchant is not here. Okay, so he, yeah. Four yeses and one absent. Okay, thank you. Uh, the thing is, I just realized this work, which I called for, we did do it. I don't think we did a roll call per se, but um, but none of the members are the work group are in on Zoom anyway. Right. I mean, um, so I think that's all right to do. But I'd like to. I appreciate your your work in trying to clear this up minutes up. Finally, the review and ratification of the May seventeenth, two thousand twenty two minutes of the delegation. Our last meeting, so that you should have those in front of you. Move accept the okay, motion by Representative Oxingham. Do I have a second on that motion? I'll second it. Uh, second it by Representative Tanner. Okay, are we ready for the vote? And uh, is a, uh, okay, we do need a roll call. I just keep, you know, thank you for reminding me, Representative O'Hearn, uh, because we're on Zoom. Okay, go ahead, when the clerk will please call the roll. Representative Aaron. I was absent, so I abstain. Yeah. Uh, Representative Gottling. Yes. I was absent. Uh, abstain. Representative Oxingham. Yes. Representative Rollins. Yes. Representative Smith. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Stapleton. Representative Stapleton. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Representative Tanner. Yes. And uh, clerk votes. Remember this. I mean, delegate. the chair votes. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I believe that. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
eight uh, yeses and two abstentions. Two abstentions, okay. Okay, fine. And the motion carries the minutes of the May 17th delegation meeting are approved. Thank you very much, and thank you for your cooperation and forbearance, everybody. But I'd like to, I want to get the, as many of these minutes out of the way as possible. All right, now finally, under old, old business. I think this is a good time. I talked with the county manager about the situation with the nursing home, and I don't know if you want to lead off or uh, or do you want me to start? I, okay. And on this coming Friday at 10 a.m. in Concord, the Joint Fiscal Committee is meeting, and they have a proposal. It's on their consent calendar to approve a, to a, a, a total of approximately 50 million. I guess actually 50 million and change. For county nursing homes, it's not—it's just nursing homes in general. It's not Sullivan County. Now, that's—I saw it on on the agenda. There's nothing because when we had our last Zoom meeting of members of the work group, and I was there uh, when we last met, and that's something about expediting it. But there's nothing in that agenda, at least, to, to say they're going to expedite it. So, and I don't know if you've been in discussions with Go for how that's going to be done, or even if it. As I understand, if it passes, and it passes the way it is now on the consent calendar, we're still going to have to do some more work. We're probably going to have to go, to go back to fiscal, or at least, the go I mean, we've got to go to governor and council eventually. And I'm, I'm trying to, these steps, is, it, we're going to have to jump through a few more hoops before we get to $25 million. But it, it looks like it's on track for the $50 million, and then we will apply for it. And the, I read the item on the consent calendar on the legislative website, and the deal is that counties have to put up 60% of the cost of a nursing home renovation, and they will provide up to 40%, which is the $25 million is, is pretty close to what the projected 40%, because we're hoping to do it for $57 million approximately. And uh, so I intend to go. Uh, I'm not sure... I may talk to Representative Umberger. I may not say say much, but I think it's important that we be there in case there's some debate on this or someone pulls it off and starts asking some questions about this. And I don't know if members of the work group, any of them want to join me. I think Representative Sullivan said he wasn't was also not available tonight. He wasn't available, but I will be there uh, because I think it's important that we watch this very carefully. And I may contact uh, at least the chair of the fiscal committee and maybe some of the members in advance because I think it's very important that this gets passed and although it looks good you know, from my experience you never know what could happen so I don't know if the county manager wanted to add anything I, I sent out the the document that um, that was provided 60-40 um, split there are two rounds of the grant that they described there's a, like a, I think they call it phase one phase two uh, the first phase is a competitive bidding round, or not uh, bidding, but a competitive round where applicants um, will have to be scored, I guess. Uh, the process, the details of the process, we still don't know those. I did have an, uh, some email exchanges with the deputy director of Gopher, uh, Chase Hageman, and he said they didn't want to get too far ahead of themselves until it was approved by both Joint Fiscal and the Governor and Council. And as soon as that's done, he would be pivoting pretty quickly to work with us on the application process. I think the way they wrote it was that the, the first round, they know we're the only county with a project that's ready to go, so they wrote it so that emphasis would be on that. And then whatever's left over would kind of filter into that phase two funding, and then any county could come forward and you know with any eligible requirements. So it does sound like they wrote this to, to kind of give us first dibs. So I think that's great. The 60-40 split, if we apply the $57 million price tag, would be 22.8 million, so not quite the full not 25, quite um, but I think that's a pretty good day's work, um, and certainly better than we, where we were a year ago. So, but a lot more details to be determined and to be worked, and um, you know we'll just have to kind of wait and see. He did indicate that the application process would entail things like just a description of the project, probably some drawings. Um, it's a similar exercise to what we just went through at the end of May. For the two million dollar congressionally directed spending uh, request, we had to actually apply for it, and uh, it, it was quite a bit of work. Uh, Mary mostly did it, thankfully, uh, but it was a budget narrative, a project abstract, um, all the drawings for the project. So we'll, we'll just be able to regurgitate all of what we did for that, or maybe recycle is a better uh, right. word. So, 
So as, assuming we get this, the 50 million passed, the fit passes it on Friday, did, did uh, Mr. Hageman from Gopher s suggest any sort of timeline what they're going to want from us right away? No, I don't know. Yeah, no. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're ready. So, and I may call Representative Unberger, but I, 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 I've never been to a fiscal committee meeting, so I want to be careful. But I think someone we need, someone from the a few people need to be there from the county to be sure if there's any questions or at least, you know, if there's going to be a debate to sort of add our, try to add our two cents worth. Uh, but I think I will check with Representative Unberger ahead of time as far as the protocol. Jeremy. Yes, Representative. Yeah, I, I plan to be there. Okay, you plan to be there too. Okay. And that's, it, we'll see what happens, but that's the first step. So it sounds like we're, we're going to make, we've got to jump through a few more hoops before we get the money. And if we do that, and then we've got to start, I guess, the bidding process, and I, and I don't know if you want to talk further. It's we'll, we'll need to reconvene, I think, as a group, uh, probably in July, because we can talk about the, the balance of the funding stack. You know, there's going to be a bond for um, the balance of the funding and figuring out the, the finer points of that, I think. So I think we probably need to regroup before we submit any of the paperwork to go for just to make sure that we're all on the same page but okay. and that's more the, the work group is that you're thinking when you're saying right or and then uh, maybe well if it leads into the discussion of how much we're going to bond for that's that's certainly an entire delegation you know okay. deliberation and a lot of noticing and public hearing and so it, i think there's all of that to be all that considered to do as well okay so we've got more work to do uh anyway regardless of what happens on friday Okay. All right. So I just wanted to update. Anybody have any other questions or comments for this information? Okay. Seeing none, uh, any new business? And I don't think we really have any new business because we took care of setting the date. So unless anybody else has anything else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn the motion, meeting. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Re motion by Representative O'Hearn. Do I have a second? Yep. A second by Representative Smith to adjourn the meeting. Okay, so I guess we're going to need a roll call yeah. vote on this. Representative Aaron? Yes. Representative Gotland? Yes. Representative uh, O'Hearn? Yes. Representative Oxingham? Yes. Representative Rollins? Yes. Representative Smith? Yes. Representative Spilsbury? Yes. Representative Stapleton? Yes. Representative Stapleton? Okay. Representative Tanner? Yes. And uh, Chair? Uh, yes.